Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Aaron Maté. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We begin with a historic ruling in federal court that the stop-and-frisk tactics used by New York police officers are unconstitutional. In a harshly critical decision, U.S. District Court Judge Shira Shinlin said police had relied on what she called a policy of indirect racial profiling that led officers to routinely stop blacks and Hispanics who would not have been stopped if they were white. Since, two, since 2002, the police department has conducted more than 5 million stop-and-frisks. According to the police department's own reports, nearly 9 out of 10 New Yorkers have been stopped and frisked, uh, have been innocent. In her almost 200-page order, Judge Shira Shenlin wrote, quote, No one should live in fear of being stopped whenever he leaves his home to go about the activities of daily life. Targeting young black and Hispanic men for stops based on the alleged criminal conduct of other young black or Hispanic men violates the bedrock principles of equality, she wrote. The ruling came after several months of testimony, much of it from eight plaintiffs who were all African American or Latino. Together, they described a total 19 incidents in which they were stopped and, in some cases, searched and frisked unlawfully. Shortly after the decision was announced, the plaintiffs in the case held a news conference alongside their lawyers. When I, when I got the call this morning, the first thing I did was cry. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it wasn't because I was sad or necessarily happy, but because it was so, I, 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 you know, I put everything to, you know, it's, it's important. And um, to know that, uh, you know, it was recognized as just, it's just, It's hard to explain. Um, uh, I, I think actually there's something else I have to say. I think it's a, it's a it's a really good picture of what's going on in, in society. I mean, it's a big thing for New York, but as far as America as a whole, it it shows the the polarization of of people of color in this country as as how how we're viewed, you know. And I think it I think it just needs to be um, recognized. You know, our voices do count and count towards something, you know, greater. And, um, you know, this has been a long time coming, you know, this, this case and you know, all the time that, you know, has been put into it, you know, and, you know, the sacrifices and, you know, just taking off work and, you know, coming here and uh, giving, you know, our testimony to, you know, a big issue, you know, that has transcended beyond the communities of black and brown. You know, people. You know, this is a you know uh, 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 um, issue that you know folks in Tribeca now understand, folks in Soho now understand, and have a, a, a really, really you know accurate understanding of this. You know, so I'm grateful for that, and um, you know the attention that it has received, and you know um, I think you know it's clear you know the psychological consequences of stop and frisk and, you know, it being a rite of passage for, you know, so many black and brown boys and, you know, having this experience and, you know, being criminalized and, you know, how that, you know, carries on to, you know, their adult years. So I think, you know, uh, we are taking some tremendous steps um, forward and um, I'm definitely grateful for that. I just feel glad that that my, um, my, my lawyers, I commend them and the, and the judge for doing an outstanding job on my behalf and the other um, plaintiffs. And um, it's, 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 just, it's just the beginning and of like reparations. And with my, with my case, um, um, I could have like sat, I could have, um, I could have been like um, Trayvon Martin because um, he just, it was just too unbearable, and I could have been in his same place, and my heart goes out to his family, and it's just, it's just very hard to um, get through this, but with the help of my parents and my friends and my lawyers, they've, they've, they've done all that they can for me, and um, I love them so very much. Um, and thinking about it, 
The reason why I joined on to this case was because many of us, including myself, feel like stop and frisk is police abuse and that that's the lowest level of police abuse. And once police abuse power when it comes to stop and frisk, then they can do it in terms of falsely arresting people, then they can do it in terms of planting evidence, and at the most extreme cases, they can do it in terms of killing people. So I think for many of us here, including myself, this is important because if we can find remedies to stop officers from violating our constitutional rights, then maybe other forms of police abuse as it relates to people in my community and other community members, maybe some of that begins to stop. Just really thankful for the people that uh, believed in us, you know, that we weren't making up these stories, we, we didn't fabricate anything, we came to the table and said this is our experiences and we're speaking for millions of other people that are going through the same thing in this city. And um, I'm just hopeful that, I know it's premature, but I, I'm hopeful that the monitor it's not too much bureaucracy with the other city uh, uh, quarter, uh, um, appointed monitors that we, we can really have some teeth in the legislation and really make changes to stop question and frisk. And, and uh, it, it, the policies can actually change, man, like not just talk about change, but really change, really make those adjustments that people can walk down the street or can stand in front of their house on a cell phone and not have to worry about, you know, being accused of a, being a drug dealer or something like that. So. I'm, I'm thankful today. Thank you. Those are the voices of Leroy Downs, Lulick Clarkson, Devin Almanor, Nicholas Pert, David Orlick, all plaintiffs in the stop and frisk lawsuit. In her ruling, Judge Shinlin found, quote, the city's highest officials have turned a blind eye to the evidence that officers are conducting stops in a racially discriminatory manner. She also appointed a federal monitor to oversee reforms with input from community members as well as police. New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg reacted angrily to the ruling and accused the judge of denying the city a fair trial. This is a very dangerous decision made by a judge that I think just does not understand how policing works and what is compliant with the U.S. Constitution as determined by the Supreme Court. We believe we have done exactly what the courts allow and the Constitution allow us to do. And we will continue to do everything we can to keep this city safe. Throughout the case, we didn't believe that we were getting a fair trial. And this decision confirms that suspicion. And we will be presenting evidence of that unfairness to the appeals court. That was Mayor Michael Bloomberg of New York City. For more, we're joined by Sunita Patel, staff attorney with the Center for Constitutional Rights, co-counsel on the case. We welcome you to Democracy Now!, your response to Judge Shira Shinlin's ruling. Uh, it's an astounding victory for everyone in New York City. She has uh, very correctly and smartly decided that the city is engaging in racial profiling. Um, and this is victor it's a victory for so many hundreds of thousands of people who've been illegally stopped and frisked over the, over the last decade. And to those who say that this is the reason crime is down and that the number of lives that have been saved from some, what, what did I hear one pundit quoting today, uh, 3,000 in a year, now down to 300 murders in a year, particularly in black and brown communities, that the number of black and brown lives saved um, is a result of this racial profiling. Well, for one, one thing, uh, there's no empirical evidence linking stop and frisk to crime reduction generally. Secondly, you know, this is a tactic that uh, this murder rate uh, reduction has been quoted in the news. I think it's a little bit blurry. Um, when this administration came, uh, you, that, that's a statistic that spans the course of, you know, 15 years. It's not something, it's not within the time period that we're talking about. When Mayor Bloomberg uh, came into office, the, cr the murder rate was already down to something, to, to a very small number. So they're taking credit for something that happened way before them, and, um, and they're blurring the math on this issue. In addition, the Crime rates have been going down nationally for the last two decades, and there just isn't a link between the two. Between the two. Can you explain uh, what Judge Shinlin ruled in, in determining that stop and frisk violates the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment, and, and also talk about the remedies that she's ordered? Yes, in the, in the Fourth Amendment uh, claim, she's saying that she said that their city has a practice, a widespread practice of 
going out and stopping people without individualized suspicion that there is crime afoot, which is what is required by the Supreme Court law um, in Terry versus Ohio. In the 14th Amendment claim, she's saying that, look, many of these stops are not only on based on or lack reasonable suspicion but they're on the basis of race the city and the new york, uh, new york police department is using race as a proxy for crime rather than looking at what is this person doing specifically that would allow the police to stop them they're saying because they're black or brown in this area we're just going to stop them to try to prevent crime which is not not uh, is not constitutional. It's illegal. Um, and then in terms of remedies, what she's done is she said uh, that she's going to appoint a federal court monitor, which is very common in policing systemic reform cases, to oversee the the day-to-day -day activity of, of reforms. And she's also said in, she wants a second phase of the reform, where community members get to have a stake in what reforms are going to happen. Um, and she's she's calling for a joint reform process that will have a facilitator that allows also allows the near Police Department to have a seat at the table to say, hey, this is what we think would work, this is what we think wouldn't work. I mean, you know, this really should be seen as an opportunity by the Police Department. Who will be the court-appointed monitor? Uh, someone named Peter Zimroth. He's a partner at Arnold and Porter. Um, we don't know, you know, the Plaintiff's Council doesn't, we didn't have anything to do with the, with the selection of the monitor, um, but we do know it sounds like he's going to be very fair-minded. He's a former Corp Counsel and dis uh, attorney, and he's a former district attorney. So, you know, in my mind, I would I would think that this is someone that the police department and the city should embrace working with. Um, and we really hope that they will do that and, and decide not to appeal this, the judge's very well-reasoned decision. During a news conference Monday, Police Commissioner Ray Kelly blasted the ruling and insisted New York City police officers do not engage in racial profiling. What I find the most disturbing and offensive about this decision is the notion that the NYPD engages in racial profiling. That simply is recklessly untrue. We do not engage in racial profiling. It is prohibited by law. It is prohibited by our own regulations. We train our officers that they need reasonable suspicion to make a stop. And I can assure you that race is never a reason to conduct a stop. The NYPD is the most racially and ethnically diverse police department in the world. In contrast with some societies, New York City and its police department have focused their crime-fighting efforts to protect the poorest members of our community, who are disproportionately the victims of murder and other violent crime. Disturbingly so. To that point, last year, 97 percent of all shooting victims were black or Hispanic and reside in low-income neighborhoods. Public housing, in just which 5 percent of the city's population resides, experiences 20 percent of the shootings. There were more stops for suspicious activity in neighborhoods with higher crime because that's where the crime is. That's NYPD com Police Commissioner uh, Ray Kelly speaking Monday. President Obama has indicated he may consider appointing Kelly the new Secretary of Homeland Security, to which Paul Butler, a law professor at Georgetown University and a former U.S. Department of Justice prosecutor, said Ray Kelly needs to be Homeland Security Secretary, like Paula Dean needs to run the United Nations World Food Program. He wrote, Commissioner Kelly is the poster child for the most racially insensitive police practice in the United States, stop and frisk. During his term in office, the number of times police stop people on the street for questioning increased from 100,000 in 2002 to about 700,000 in 2011. But Commissioner Kelly is saying that they are doing this in high crime communities and saving lives in those communities. Well, you know, this is something that was analyzed ad nauseum by the court. We had two statistical experts um, that testified multiple times in the case, and she said this is just absolutely false. She gave very little weight to this argument, because in reality, um, the, the, the number of times that officers actually check the box on the UF-250 form that says that they're stopping someone based on 
a, a suspect description is not is not that high. It's between 10 and 15 percent, depending on the year. Instead, they 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 check this box that says high crime area. And when our statistical expert analyzed each incident from 2002 to June 2012, when that box was checked, you know, we found that when you control for all other factors, race is what is determinative. Not it's not actually the the area and the and the and the crime rate. What about cameras? So the judge has um, ordered the city to uh, test out in a, in, and to do a study and an evaluation of body-worn cameras. This is something that um, has been done in, you know, a few small jurisdictions around the country and has had a favorable impact on the reducing the number of complaints against police officers. Again, this is something that the police department, if it's doing its job correctly and and, and is actually not engaging in racial profiling, would actually help and support police officers when there are complaints filed against them. You'd actually have a contemporaneous record of what's going on. It's similar in some ways to traffic cameras that, um, that are becoming standard in many large urban jurisdictions where there are complaints against police officers. Now, the term itself, stop and frisk, can sound kind of harmless, you know, a stop and frisk, or it implies a pat down. But what is the reality of this practice that you see from talking to your clients? I mean, the reality is, I mean, that's a great question because I think a lot of people think of it as a very just like blase, it's just a frisk, it's just a pat down. What we heard in the trial was testimony from 12 people who said, look, this is, this is humiliating, this is degrading, this is something that no one should have to go through, and even worse, it's something that is uh, that entire generation of black and brown people is becoming desensitized to. And we're talking about something that is physically invasive and 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 uh, and degrading. You know, you're, this is an officer that's saying, "Hey, put your hands against the wall," and aggressively putting their hands over their bodies. Or down their waist, down their pant legs, both sides, and one of our plaintiffs, uh, or one of our witnesses, even testified about, um, you know, being being grabbed in the in the growing area, and he felt com on his 18th birthday, and he just felt that this was so humiliating. He filed a complaint, and you know, at that at that young age, to even. To, to bring that forward and to, to make that kind of claim and then feel that that was that, that the officer was not held accountable I and mean, it really has a lasting detrimental impact on the relationship between the police and the community so what happens from here the city says they'll appeal the city says they'll appeal um, as I said earlier I really hope that after they carefully consider the decision they'll decide not to however you know they they may appeal they're, they're uh, apparently Michael Cardozo said that they're considering when they can appeal it's not clear if they can appeal yet um, and and they will pro likely file a stay, which is uh, something asking for the court, the last Judge Shinlin, to um, stay her injunction so that they don't have to do anything right now. I want to thank you very much, Sunita, um, for joining us. Sunita Patel is a staff attorney with the Center for Constitutional Rights, co-counsel on the Stop and Frisk Federal Action uh, Lawsuit. This is.